In May 1972, workers at a French reprocessing plant noticed something very suspicious about the uranium they were getting from one of their mines. Of course, the mine wasn't in France. It was in Gabon, West Africa, a former French colony. And they were mining the uranium there. And then when they were looking at the concentration of uranium-235, remember, that's the good stuff. That's the fissionable things, the fissile material. When they were looking at that concentration, they saw some missing. And this is weird. How do you suddenly not have the normal isotopic ratio? How can there be less U-235 there than there is on the rest of the planet? This is a place called Oklo. And clearly, something was going on. So the scientists went down there, and it's a fairly rich uranium mine. Here's some of the rocks. You can even see the, the yellow cake just being there in veins. And some of these pockets actually were very dense with uranium. So they took samples, they took tests, dug things out, looked at stuff. And what they found absolutely amazing. You see, they found fission products. They found the decay products and elements and isotopes that would only ever exist if a nuclear reaction had taken place. This was a natural nuclear reactor. We all thought it was Fermi in 1942 who first figured out how to make fission in a lab or anywhere on the planet, for heaven's sakes. But two billion years ago, this occurred. Why? Well, remember about half-lives. Today, if I look at the isotopic abundance of U-235, it's 0.7%. And of course, that means that the rest of the uranium, the U-238, is 99.3%. But the half-life of uranium-235 is 0.7 billion years. And the half-life of uranium-238 is 4.5 billion years. So if I go 700 million years in the past, this doesn't become 0.7%, it becomes 1.4%. If I go another half-life, that becomes closer to 3%. This one's going down a little, so it's not exact. But approximately 2 billion years ago, this was 3% and 97%. 3% is the number you need to be able to have fission. These days, we have reprocessing and we have enrichment plants that up this percentage to 3% so we can run it in a nuclear reactor. If you just went 2 billion years back in time, all of the uranium you could dig up around the planet was 3% U-235. But of course, it takes more than just having the right isotopic abundance to be able to make fission. What you also need is a moderator. You need something that slows down the neutrons, makes them thermal, in which case they can then interact with another U-235 and cause a fission, release more neutrons. A moderator has to slow those neutrons down. Then again, you can have this sustained chain reaction. So how would you get a moderator? Well, remember, our typical moderator is water. So maybe if I had just the right geology, I could have a natural nuclear reactor. So how could you have that particular geometry of the geology? Maybe it could look something like this. This is a rough cross-section map of the Okolo mine in Gabon, West Africa. And this band you see here, the number three, that's an underground river. 
Now, don't think an underground river is like some amusement park ride where you're on a boat and you're going through a tunnel on water. Underground rivers don't look like that. Underground rivers are collections of uh, gravel, of permeable rock, sand, things water can flow through. So if I have a band of things where water can throw, flow through, and some like impermeable bedrock so that water would collect up here and then flow this way, and then these black areas, these are actually the uranium deposits. We are set up to have a reactor. Step one, rains a lot, water pools in, the water comes through, we have a moderator. Now, if you have a chain nuclear reaction, you have some energy. We're not talking about atom bombs. This isn't 90% U-235, right? But what's going to happen is very interesting. It's going to get warm, and that water is going to boil. It's going to boil away. But remember one of the inherent safety features of nuclear reactors. If the water boils away, no moderator, and the reaction stops. By carefully looking at the isotopes that were left and figuring out what the operation pattern must have been, it seemed like maybe it could operate for 30 minutes, and be off for two and a half hours or so, maybe come back on for 30 minutes if the water rushed back into that area, and continue this for millions of years, whenever there was a really big rain and the water would come down just right. It doesn't make mushroom clouds. It doesn't, you know, blow up over the ground. It just boils the water away, sort of like an old faithful. Builds up enough heat. When the water comes back in, the moderator comes back in. This graph shows four, but there were actually 16 pockets that did this. And then, as scientists looked further in other regions in Africa, this wasn't the only place that had a natural nuclear reactor. What can we learn about this? Well, we can learn a couple things. The first is that sort of the hubris of mankind that, oh, we've invented everything. Well, nature always has ways of surprising us. This is interesting. <laughs> nature had a nuclear reactor. But the other is to look at the waste products. You see, in a nuclear reactor, everything is designed to keep those fission products in place. First, you take an oxide fuel that's a ceramic so it won't melt. Then you put that into a fuel pellet. The pellet is in a fuel pin. The pin is in a fuel rod. The rod's in a reactor vessel. The reactor vessel's in a containment building. These fission products, they're in an underground river. They just wash downstream. So when scientists go to say, where are these unique isotopes? Where are these fission products? The end of the decay chain. That's how we know the nuclear reactor really happened there. there these elements should not exist in nature. Finding them and finding their distribution away from the spots where they were created gives us an idea about waste migration over geologic timescales. And the answer is surprising. They didn't go very far. So when people say, how could you ever imagine storing nuclear waste and thinking that it would stay there for millions of years? Oklo, West Africa. That's what you need to know about natural nuclear reactors.